This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Ramika Vincent Leary and welcome to this edition of In Studio. Long before the golden age of television, an innovative trailblazer was making waves in the realm of radio. Dr. Clarence Morgan, better known as a Hoosier schoolmaster of the air, was a broadcasting pioneer and champion for civil rights. He was a brainchild of many firsts that have made an impacting difference in our society. His legacy is far reaching and an interesting factoid is that he also has a distinct Florida connection. Now that we've piqued your interest, stay with us. It's all coming up right after this. Welcome back everyone. As we begin our journey, this segment will focus on Dr. Clarence Morgan's early years, flashbacks to meeting and marrying his lovely wife, Ruth, his Indiana State Teaching College radio ventures, and the overarching necessity for expanded research on the Hoosier Schoolmaster of the Air. I'm happy to welcome Dr. Stephen Perry, Professor and Interim Dean at Regent University. He joins us via telephone from Virginia Beach, Virginia. On set, Hello. I have Dr. Mary Myers, award-winning researcher and faculty member at Regent University, including Dr. Thomas Morgan, son of Dr. Clarence Morgan. It's a pleasure to have all of you here. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, so Good Mary. To be here. All right, Dr. Perry as well. Mary, let's start with you because the research was birthed. Take us to the beginning. <laughs> the research was birthed out of the necessity for a term paper. It's as simple as that. I needed a paper for Dr. Perry's historical critical class. I could not come up with any ideas at all. Every one he shot down. And so I closed my computer, put my head on my computer, and started praying, Dear Lord, give me an idea. I just need an idea. So, Dr. Perry, <laughs> let's come to you because, hey, the ball was in your court, right? <laughs> you know, I just, uh, I, I guess I'm really the mean guy here that <laughs> would not take any of her other ideas. Yeah. Um, but I do remember when she said, hey, um, I have this, this friend, a former professor, uh, who has personal papers that relate to his father, who was this broadcaster from Indiana and, and an educator. And, and I said, yes, that sounds good. Go with that. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dr. Perry, you've had a longstanding history in radio, as I understand, right? Um, well, yes, certainly worked in radio in my young years and then uh, went on and got a Ph.D. and and have researched radio. Uh, it's been one of my areas of interest is researching uh, radio in different aspects, but a lot of it being history of radio. All right, we'll come back to you in just a moment. So, Dr. Morgan, reading about your dad, I tell you what, such a trailblazer in many respects. We're going to start off before I expand my conversation with you. Some years ago, you interviewed your mom and dad so viewers, we're going to find out now how Dr. Morgan maybe had that sparked interest in radio. Take a listen. When did you first get interested in radio? Oh my gosh, Tom, I've been that way all my life because uh, uh, this is relatively unknown, but uh, I grew up in a home where there was a telegraph instrument instead of a telephone. All of the homes in Linton, which was a coal mining community, had telegraphs before they had telephones so they could communicate with one another in case of disaster. Mm -hmm. So I knew the code. And when this new thing called wireless came along, I got terrifically interested in it. And so as early as 1916 and 17, I had instruments for receiving and sending uh, signals. They were all old spark well then. Mm -hmm. But I got my, uh, I really did my first work about 1917. The war came along and had to take everything down. You destroyed it because they would not let any amateur work 
uh-huh. in 19. So I came back in 19, oh, around 1920 again. In 1924, I renewed my, I got my license, the 9 DHV, Dog Al Victor. Uh-huh. And from then on, it was uh-huh. Doc 2. Uh-huh. Doc 2, and I know that you want me to also call you Doc, is that correct? <laughs> that now, got passed down. Okay, all right. So you have some interesting items right here. Oh, you Why don't you to take dig one into the out? Box? Yeah, dig into one and then tell right. us what we're about to see here. Well, this weird looking device was a uh, radio receiver and it worked by sliding back. And this was handmade, by the way. My father made it out of an Oaks box he uh, stole from his uh, mother's kitchen. Oh, okay. And uh, he hand wound it and hand wrapped it. And you just literally dialed it in, you know, by turning the knob here and sliding this back and forth and listening on headphones. Circa early 1900s? Uh, this is about 1918, 1919, right. Phenomenal. Now there's something else in that, well, that box of yours as well. Let me slide this over. Yeah. If you're talking radio receiving, let's go with a little one. That's a crystal set. In here, I'll tilt it so the camera can see it. There is a tiny raw crystal, and what you did was you simply moved this around. It was called a cat's whisker, and you moved it around until you could detect a radio signal, and then you would tighten this part down so that the cat's whisker would stay there. You'd hook your headphones on here, and then you would listen. Very simple. Amazing. I'll get back to you in just a moment. So. And I know I call you Mary all the time, so let me start <laughs> <That's perfectly fine. laughs> the procedure here. Purposeful research and the sensitivity therein. Expand okay. on that in regards I will. to this. Um, when I came up with the idea to pursue this research, I called Doc on the phone and requested that I do a paper on his dad. And he gave me permission. And he said, Karen and I are going away for two and a half weeks or so. When we get back, feel free to interview me. Well, my paper was due the night before they returned home. So I talked to him, asked him a few questions. That gave me quotes for the paper. And then I went to research him, hung up the phone, went to research it. I couldn't find anything. I found the man's obituary. And it hit me then and there, I'm dealing with a real person. Absolutely. And so when Doc and his wife came back from vacation, I sat down and talked to him. And I, I said, I would like to pursue this research, but I want you to know that I understand this is your family. And if at any time it gets to be too difficult for you, I will back off. And in the course of research, I've done that several times over the past couple of years. I've always offered him an out because I understand that. But at the same time, the research has proven that this is an overlooked pioneer. And we know that for a fact. Dr. Perry, let me come back to you because early radio broadcasting in general, and when Dr. Myers, my good friend Mary, came to you with that dissertation idea, how did you feel? What was your first thought? Well, I, I was thrilled that we had a student that was interested in doing a historical study on radio. Um, as a person who does that, I just know that there are not that many of us who are still interested in radio. A lot of people interested in early television or, you know, television, of course, much more impactful visually. Um, but, but to have someone that was interested in looking at the history of radio, I loved that idea. And, of course, I knew that uh, what she hasn't told you yet is that Dr. Myers did not actually think she would ever want to do a historical dissertation. Really? So the fact that she ended up going that direction <laughs> was, was, was music to my ears. She has a lot of cheerleaders. <laughs> Doc, <laughs> back to you. When your dad received his first license, I know he's told you a lot about that. Share some thoughts regarding that. Well, I mean, understand, radio was kind of the Wild West. I mean, broadcasting was not a word that was even spoken much uh, in the United States or anywhere else. There were people like my dad and others who were interested in it. And you heard dad was interested in it because of the coal mining connection. So he just decided to learn what he could, so he read what there was available on it. Uh, there weren't any radio societies or anything that you could talk to, the groups of other people. But what he found he shared and what they found they shared. And soon 
when they began, and they all communicated with Morse code. Uh, so when they would communicate back and forth, they would, hey, have you tried this kind of wire? You know, copper is a better wire than and uh, steel wire, you know, that type of thing. So it was literally, nobody knew anything about it back then. Take us into the realm <clears throat> of the Great Depression. Oh boy. Well, the Great <laughs> Depression radio was when radio really shined. Of course, by then, the Radio Act of 27 had been passed, which set aside frequencies because everybody was broadcasting on whatever power on just a couple of frequencies that were set up by the Department of Navigation Bureau of Commerce. Uh, they were interested in radio because now when a ship went beyond the horizon, they could actually communicate with it. Before, when a ship went over the horizon, if it never came back, you didn't know what happened to it. So when the 1930s came along, you had the Radio Act of 27 was upgraded to the Communications Act of 34, which really got the chaotic nature of radio straightened out. But along comes the Great Depression. And mm -hmm. people couldn't afford newspapers, they couldn't afford to go no. to the movies, but they could listen to the radio. So this is where the term the golden age of radio comes in, you know, between the mid-30s and 1939, because radio gave people something to do. It informed them about the god-awful situation that the country was in, and very importantly, it gave them hope. You had a president in Franklin Roosevelt who realized the power of radio and he created he his fireside chats. And every one of them began with, my friends, and you are my friends. I would like to visit with you tonight. And then he would, he would talk about whatever it was he wanted to talk about. He built a real, the first real connection between an, an executive, an American president, and the people he was president of. Remarkable. Now let's talk about the first radio course taught at Indiana State back in the day. Well, about, about two or three months before the Great Depression, Indiana State University, known as Indiana State Teachers College at that time, hired a young physics professor from Indiana University. It sounds confusing, doesn't it? His too name, many Indianas. Yeah, too <laughs> many Indianas. Let's take one out. His name was J.B. Hirschman, and he came on board and offered the first course in June of 1929, and then the first faculty broadcast was August 9th of 1929. So Indiana State University is coming up on their 90th anniversary of continual radio broadcasts. That's amazing, and as I understand, in 1936 is when students began to call your father Doc. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> he got his master's from Indiana State in 1931. And Dad originally wanted to be a uh, high school principal, so he actually got an EDD, which is a doctor of education. But then he got called over to the president's office at Indiana State, and they said, we think this radio business is going to amount to something, and we as, re as, a, as a teacher's college yeah. should utilize it in the best way possible to aid teachers. And we want to use your expertise because there wasn't a lot of expertise around even at that yeah. time in radio and we want you to do that for us. And that's how the Hoosier Schoolmaster of the Air was born. Indeed. <laughs> Folks, as we head to break, we want to provide you with more information about Dr. Clarence Morgan, the Hoosier Schoolmaster of the Air. Just log on to the website, clarencemmorgan.com. Don't touch that dial, we'll be right back.
Working as the Hoosier Schoolmaster of the Air, Doc Morgan and his students and associates fill the air with unique and imaginative programming. Two highly successful programs, the Story Princes of the Music Box and the Peter Rabbit News Service, were just part of the more than 9,000 programs which were broadcast live on WBOW under Doc Morgan's personal supervision. Beginning in 1937, over 530 episodes of the Story Princes were broadcast. Here are the cast and sound effects team from an early 1950s era production. Originating from the then state-of-the-art air-conditioned production facility on the ISU campus, the production aired over a 28-year period. The Peter Rabbit News Service was Doc's unique way of reporting news and current events to a children's audience. Hello, everyone. You just saw a Hall of Fame video clip honoring the work of Dr. Clarence Morgan. As you can see, he was a trailblazer in many respects. So I know my guests are eager to expand the journey, delving into the late 1930s and beyond. I'd like to welcome back Dr. Stephen Perry, professor and interim dean at Regent University, joining us on the phone. Plus, we're happy to continue the discussion with our on-set guests, Dr. Mary Myers, who serves on the faculty at Regent University, and Dr. Thomas Morgan, the son of this great radio pioneer. Dr. Morgan, it must be quite emotional for you to view clips like the one we just saw. Well, actually, it uh, just brings back a lot of great memories. Mm -hmm. My father was a very uh, um, quiet individual. Uh, he wasn't a big public guy and so on, which is why he took the name the Hoosier Schoolmaster of the Air. He didn't want his name after every broadcast because at one time he was doing 15 broadcasts a week live from Indiana State. Yeah. And uh, he thought that was just a little much. So he, from Edward Eggleston's novel, The Hoosier Schoolmaster, he decided he would be the Hoosier Schoolmaster of the Air. And there are many people who never knew who that actually was. Yeah. Yes, phenomenal research. Dr. Perry, let's talk a little bit about the meaning of recordings for listeners through your research, radio. Yeah. Well, um, one of the interesting things is that when uh, Dr. Morgan Doc was starting his radio work, uh, recording, of course, was very expensive and it wasn't very high quality. It was there was wire transcriptions, or they would record to a, a record disc and to play back. Uh, they didn't have the kind of magnetic tape or, or good quality uh, recordings that they do now. So a lot of early radio wasn't even saved. So the ability to record later on, of course, allows for us to time shift the programs, and it could be repeated, and so what somebody said on uh, or sang on Last week's program could be rebroadcast l later on, and it, it just allows a lot of flexibility for the listener in terms of, uh, you know, being able to hear that thing that they missed, because before recording, once it aired, it was just gone. It disappeared. There was no way to get it back. So it was important uh, in a lot of ways, and of course, we know that today as we have DVRs to record our TV so that we can go out to dinner and come back and watch that show we wanted to watch. And it's really a lot the same in terms of thinking about how radio, uh, it, gradually that evolved in radio. Absolutely. So, Mary, the universal voice recorder, and I know we heard from Dr. Perry just a moment ago, but expand a little bit on that. Well, it wasn't just recording the programs for posterity. It was actually a learning tool. Dr. Morgan used those recordings to teach his students what they were doing right, what they were doing wrong. You have something right I next to you. One do. of the beautiful princess box. So, Story Princess of the Music Box. Yep. There was a music box in the radio studios at Indiana State University, and it came to Dr. Morgan. <laughs> The name of the program was the Fairy Princess of the Music Box. It evolved into the Story Princess of the Music Box. And it was one, or it is one of the longest running children's programs in broadcast history. So do we have someone right now in our era who has carried on that tradition? Well, there are several Story Princesses that, that are alive. Um, they were doing the Story Princess program up through 1969. One of those is Julie Reader Fairley. 
She was the voice in 63, 64, around the same time as Dr. Morgan, Doc, Doc. was going to school <laughs> under his father. Now let's talk about the Peter Rabbit News Service. The Peter Rabbit News Service didn't come along until after World War II. The Story Princess was the end of the 1930s. So one of the things that we would like to highlight, and we know that in the classroom that your dad impacted so many lives, and from a PR standpoint, <laughs> right? He, he was a great spokesperson for the college. So we would like to share a clip right now. This is from an interview that you did with your dad. And in it, he talks about the radio facilities at the college. Take a listen. And I had a huge neon sign that I put above the door. And every time we were on the air, it said Indiana State Teachers College on the air. So that every time the president opened his door, <laughs> he saw that, and, and he, he could he step. He was getting his $600 uh, worth. Uh, uh, yeah, they said I was the best PR man they had, because yeah. when he saw that, he brought the guests in to see us broadcasting, you see. I love his laugh, Doc. <laughs> he did that a lot. <laughs> I think you have inherited that. Well, I would hope so, but one never knows. <laughs> one never knows. Let's talk about the national $8,000 grant to expand different courses over time. Dr. Morgan's work was so well known. Um, the U.S. Office of Education gave him an $8,000 grant to expand his radio work into adult extension courses. And that was in the late 30s, at the same time they built the first radio studio for the $600 that was mentioned in the clip. That is phenomenal. We, your dad, World War I, okay, a lot of things happening during that era, but then we delve into World War II, Doc. Why don't you talk about what your, do your dad was doing at that time? Well, he was too old to serve. He was 38 when I was born. I was born six months before Pearl Harbor. But dad had a skill in radio that was drastically needed because unlike in World War I, all the ships, all the airplanes and so on were radio equipped. So dad taught Navy flyers, yeah. Morse code, and he taught radio techniques to those people. And speaking of which, we actually have another clip regarding what he did during World War II. Viewers? They called me in and asked if I could teach code. And I said, well, I, I, yes, I could. The radio code, because that's what a ham operator has to know. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up teaching a radio code to the Naval Aviation Cadets. Mm -hmm. We started at 7 o'clock in the morning, and the last class was at 6 o'clock that night. And in that time, I had taught my regular college class and six courses in radio code. Mm -hmm. So I didn't see you very much mm -hmm. until the weekends. And on the Sunday afternoon, I went to the airport and taught the CAP, the Civil Air Patrol, radio code. So they could fly beam. That's what they were learning. They were learning to fly the beam flight, which required the knowledge of code. Mm -hmm. And uh, so all during the war, I taught both the beginning and advanced radio code to aviation cadets. Phenomenal. Dr. Perry, back to you, the significance, the value of war programs in the realm of radio. Please talk about that. Sure. Across the United States, uh, a lot of the people who had worked in radio did get, uh, you know, drafted into the military or they joined the military or they joined the war effort in various ways. But, but stations also had to continue to be part of alerting the public, the, the letting people know what supplies were needed. And, of course, there was a lot of uh, conservation of, of even foodstuffs, oils, things like that, the tires that they would they would take and recycle and turn those into things that were part of the war effort. And radio would champion those drives. They would, um, you know, put on programs that were uh, about uh, war bonds, uh, you know, things that they would tell people, you know, not to do to reveal like locations of ships or troops or things like that you know i mean a lot of that information was shared via radio and um was part of just getting the whole
population behind World War II effort. Thank you for that, Dr. Perry. Your dad saw the human race. He didn't see color, didn't matter what shade of melanin a person possessed. <laughs> so in that respect, Robert Gill. Talk about him for us, please. Well, I really didn't know him. I just knew him through, you know, my father. And uh, Dad didn't care. I mean, it, it, at our dinner table, you never knew if it, there would be Asian, if there would be African American. Mm -hmm. uh, he even almost adopted a boy from Jordan who was over here and very, very lonely. If they were interested in radio, he was interested in them. So as an African-American male married during that era, Robert Gill, I know that a lot of people would say, hey, you really didn't hear about many African-Americans during that time actually being on radio. So yeah. that was a huge factor. It was a huge factor, and he was the first African-American radio announcer in the state of Indiana, and Dr. Morgan trained him. Much, much work. I notice you have a pen on your lapel. What is it? Well, I had the honor of accepting that from my father in what would have been the 100th year of his life in 2003. He was inducted into the Indiana Broadcast Pioneers Hall of Fame. And perfectly, he was nominated by his, a number of his students, particularly a fellow that I knew as a sportscaster when I was a teenager by the name of Darrell Weibel. Uh, he came to me and he said, I'm going to nominate your dad because it's just wrong that he's not in the Indiana Broadcast Pioneers Hall of Fame. And so it's a little microphone. It looks like an RCA BK-44. And on the top of it, it says Pioneer. And I wear it vowed very proudly in his memory. I love it. So, Mary, briefly, the significance of Carol Atkinson, her book. Although Morgan tried to fly below the radar because he was a very humble man, the work that he did was of such high quality that it appeared in national publications. And that was one of them, Carol Atkinson's book, Broadcasting by Colleges and Universities. Okay, hold that thought, if you will. Folks, as we head to break, Dr. Clarence Morgan was a think-outside-the-box pioneer. Here's what a former student and colleague had to say about his impact on young radio listeners. In typical Doc Morgan fashion, I can remember his telling the story about the very early days of broadcasting children's programming into the schools. Some of the schools didn't have electricity. So on a given day, say a Friday, when the Peter Rabbit News Service was broadcast, the children would bring extension cords to school, and then they would hook into a nearby farmhouse that had electricity so they could listen to the broadcast. back and shifting gears. I know our phoning guest, Dr. Stephen Perry, has been enjoying the conversation. So glad to have you. Dr. Mary Myers is here as well, including Dr. Thomas Morgan, the Hoosier Schoolmaster of the Air's Son. Folks, now our journey will focus on Dr. Morgan's latter years leading into his retirement. Thomas, Take us back to the time when your mom and dad were considering retirement and what that meant to you. Were there thoughts of maybe 
following in your father's footsteps, like father, <laughs> like son? No, that was a pure accident. <laughs> that was a pure accident. First of all, I knew my father's shoes were very large, and oh. I never, ever dreamed that I would fill them. I uh, understand. And it, uh, it was just a series of very fortunate circumstances that took me into education. And, and uh, I had the pleasure of working with my father, uh, building WVIS on the campus of Indiana State. And that year really interested me in teaching people about radio and in educational broadcasting because I was headed for commercial broadcasting. Uh, I'd been on the air and, and, uh, and that was why I was asked to come and work with him in actually building a radio station because as you've talked about, yeah. he went through WBOW. He didn't go through his own station. And the university got to a point in time where they wanted to change that. And so that's how he and I got to work to week together for one glorious year. But fill, filling in his shoes, following in his footsteps, never dreamed I would do that. But I wound up doing it. Great Somebody, memories. I think, had an idea on that <laughs> Someone one Someone had an idea, right? Yeah. <laughs> and he did. He did it at Murray State in Kentucky. He was the bluegrass schoolmaster of the air. Love that. <laughs> well, like my dad, I didn't want my name after all the broadcasts. And... Uh, so I, I literally built the radio TV program at Murray State, Murray, Kentucky, and built WKMS FM on that campus. And because I had done that, when they were building what is today the University of Central Florida, yeah. they called me and said, hey, we're building a university down here. We'd like for you to build a radio TV department down here. And while mm -hmm. you're at it, we'd like an FM station and a television station. Florida Connection. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> so what do you have before us? We see something here on the set. Tell us well, what we're Well, a lot of right people here. would think that's a piece of junk. But actually, that's, <laughs> that's, a, not. Uh, that, that's a radio transmitting and receiving station. And unlike the one I showed you earlier, this one is very, very crude. Dad, when Dad and Dad made it again using a Quaker Oats box, I think if Quaker Oats hadn't been around, he wouldn't have gotten into radio. But literally, you change the antenna by clipping on these different little hand units, and this was connected to a Christmas tree bulb. And <laughs> when the when you connected on and the bulb glowed the brightest, then you knew you had the best radio signal coming in. Wow. It had a single See vacuum tube. Vacuum tubes came along in 1907, and they brought the power to radio that radio lacked. Mm -hmm. So Dad could actually send and receive, and this was his send-receive switch mm -hmm. right here, uh, 700 miles with this little tiny. It was oh, he stole his mother's breadboard too that he built it on. Hope so he, hope he didn't get in trouble for he, that. He probably yeah. did. <laughs> knowing but, Grandma Morgan, I'm sure he did. So Mary, <laughs> let's talk about the 11 room studio suite and all the other expansive things that happened. Well, on April 14th, 1950, NBC did a coast to coast broadcast dedicating two new buildings on the campus of Indiana State University. They also dedicated the 11 room suite that Doc Morgan had helped design and had built in one of those buildings. Amazing. Dr. Perry, back to you. Translations. Talk about some of the languages. We know Spanish, of course, we speak English, but talk about that briefly, will you? Um, well, just obviously uh, the radio stations, I think this is what you're getting at. The radio stations yes. went a long way, and so, mm -hmm. in, especially at night, and people would, uh, with these devices that Doc's talking about, they would try to pick up stations from far away. And so certainly they would pick up stations that were from uh, the, the, the X stations that were over the border into Mexico. <laughs> they would be trying to tune those in, and people would have a badge of honor based on how many stations they could confirm having received on some of these early radio sets. Love it. No. Let's talk about Ruth's journey because we know, hey, woman, man, <laughs> and she did a lot herself. So let's talk about her accomplishments. Well, mom was, uh, mom could spot a comma splice at 50 yards. She became a Danger university zone. English <laughs> professor. Definitely. So needless to say, I was taught grammar from uh, the day I was born. Uh, but mom was a travel writer and a, a teacher of English at uh, Indiana State. For 19 years, she taught uh, actually on the same floor as my father in the same building. Mm -hmm. And mom always made lunch, and so they always had lunch together at one of their I desks and so yeah. on. Uh, she was a graduate of Mount Holyoke. Uh, 
uh, summa cum laude of Phi Beta Kappa. I don't know what happened to me, but mom was very oh, smart. Oh, you're doing well. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she used her, uh, her, 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 her training well. Mary, Florida Atlantic University. A lot of people, we have a lot of bridge employment these days. Someone will retire from, from one place and they'll start working somewhere else. So technically, your mom and dad didn't stop working. No, they didn't, uh, much to my surprise, uh, mm. because dad was 66 and uh, mom was 59 when they retired. But uh, they were at a party at uh, Boca Raton. They ran into the Dean of Humanities at Florida Atlantic, and he said, I wish I had people like you in the classroom these days. And my mother said, are you offering us a job? And he said, yeah. So <laughs> they He's both wound up teaching at Florida Atlantic <laughs> yeah. University strictly for the fun of it. They both loved it. Uh, my father taught until I finally talked him out of the classroom because he, his hearing was so bad, I knew he was reading lips. He couldn't, he couldn't really hear his students. But they loved it that much. They, mm. they taught as long they as they eager, possibly could. Eager to come to class. We know that the Peter Rabbit News Service received recognition from CBS. Would you like right. to talk about that, Mary? Um, when this, the Peter Rabbit News Service came on the air in 1948, it was the only children's program based on news that was ever produced. CBS recognized that fact in the early 60s and put it in writing. It was also translated into Spanish and for broadcast in Latin American countries. So it really went a long way. It didn't just impact or influence the American children. It was children in other countries. Dr. Perry, hearing that, I know you are, it brings back a lot of memories for you. Educational television workshop, closed circuit, installation, radio, yeah. tape network, ring any bells? <laughs> well, uh, you know, one of the things that was really cool in Indiana is uh, when television was coming along, and of course they were looking for, uh, there, there's always, well, I shouldn't say there has always been, but in the earlier days before we had so many channels available through cable TV, there was a lot of push for ha reserving space for education. And... Um, but there, there are unique ways to deliver that. Mm -hmm. And in Indiana, there around uh, where Doc Morgan was working, um, they actually developed a, uh, a, an airplane service that during the day airplanes would fly and uh, transmit educational programming that schools or people in their homes could pick up and, <laughs> and um, you know, students could receive programs via that uh, broadcast. And of course, um, you know, we have PBS stations and, and the public radio version of that, National Public Radio, that have always done educational programming and shared tapes through a network where they, they circulated, recorded programming, and so forth. So, We appreciate that insight. Mary, women in radio, and one in particular, Wanda Ramey. Wanda Ramey was one of Doc Morgan's students who went out west, was hired by a radio station out in the San Francisco area, and became the first women's television reporter on the West Coast. She was only the second in the nation. Trailblazing people. Mm -hmm. I know that. Yeah. You have many stories of your own, don't you? Too many. Too many. <laughs> Why don't you share one? Because having seen all these great innovations from your mom and your dad, I know that their work inspired you in so many ways. Well, you know, as, as dad's son, uh, it was just what he did. At, at the time, I didn't think there was anything particularly unusual about it. it. I grew up with the Story Princess of the Music Box. I grew up with the Peter Rabbit News Service. And I grew up surrounded by Navy flyers, you know, during the war. So it was just, I guess like a lot of children, it was just what my father did. But then later when I was myself building radio stations, when I was myself developing classes, when I was myself trying to keep up with all the innovations that my father had had to keep up with, then I understood truly, you know, what a tremendous guy he was and how much work it was to do what he did and stay on top of it. Because radio was then, like television and like the Internet today, it was evolving. And uh, Dad had to evolve with it or he couldn't have done what he did. And he knew that, so he worked very, very hard to keep up with it 
even after he retired and, and I was in the field, he would sit down after Christmas dinner or whatever and he'd say, now, tell me what's going on. He still went, in the 80s, you know, he Love wanted that. he wanted to know, you know, what the new innovations were. Because dad started with vacuum tubes and uh, went through the transistors and then went through the integrated circuits and then, and I was working with chips. And my father looked mm. at me and he said, I feel like an idiot, but what's a chip? <laughs> what is that? But by the time I got through, he understood precisely mm. what it was, how it worked and was fascinated by it. He loved all the innovation. A sponge for knowledge, I like that. So Mary, yeah. W-V-I-S slash W-I-S-U. Well, both <laughs> docs could probably tell you about that better than I can, but that is the FM station at Indiana State University. It began life as W-V-I-S. The call letters were changed to WISU, and this year it is celebrating its 55th anniversary on the air, and both Dr. Morgans built it. So, Dr. Perry, hearing about Drs. Morgan, Ruth, and Clarence <laughs> O. Morgan, when you were reading Mary's dissertation, <laughs> what thoughts came to your mind? I'm putting you on the spot here, the depth yeah. of her research. <laughs> well, um, obviously, this is a great, um, a great study of how we trained radio people through our colleges and, and by having stations built at colleges. And one of the interesting things I learned along the way, um, I kind of thought, I, I taught for a bit at, in, at Illinois State University, and I kind of thought, oh, well, uh, you know, we did something like that over there. Well, really, it was Doc Morgan at Indiana State right. training people who then went over to Illinois and at Illinois State developed a radio program. And uh, the interesting thing is that one of the students there, when I was there, I taught a man by the name of Rich Green. Well, Rich Green is now the director of the radio station and programs at Indiana State University. <laughs> so um, there's a lot of sharing and shared history that I had no knowledge of before Mary's dissertation. Um, you know, I just really didn't know a lot about what, um, you know, what the history of the educational side in the Midwest was. Most of what you read about in the history of radio, so much of it's based out of New York because that's where the history was writ recorded and written down. And so when we have people like Mary who go to the heartland of the country, to the Midwest, and they find history there that there wasn't a corporate entity that was saving all this and, and, and putting it in an archive, it's great because we're expanding our knowledge about how radio worked in other places. And, uh, you know, and, and of course, with his Florida connections, uh, eventually coming down to Florida with all that. So. Thank you so much, Dr. Perry. As we all know, Dr. Clarence Morgan has a rich history that is quite inspirational. Even after he retired, he was still a man on the move. Here's another video clip from the Hoosier Schoolmaster of the Heirs Hall of Fame. Though he retired from Indiana State in 1969 and moved to Boca Raton, Doc never really retired from teaching. It was to the great benefit of additional generations of students that both Doc and Ruth continued to teach as adjuncts at Florida Atlantic University for 17 years. The legacy of Doc Morgan continues to this day, not only in the person of his son, Tom, but also through the significant contributions of his former students and the positive impact that they've had in the communications industry today.
glad to welcome back Dr. Stephen Perry, who has been with us via telephone the entire time. Now, as our journey continues, Drs. Myers and Morgan will apprise us of what is on the horizon, addressing that heartfelt question, where do we go from here? So, Mary, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's chat. Okay. <laughs> there is a lot of room to go places with this research. So far, it's been two award-winning articles, research articles, conference presentations. And this year, we're going to be going to Indiana State University, who will be celebrating and recognizing Morgan's legacy. However, as Doc was saying, or as actually Dr. Perry was saying, Rich Green, who is handling their radio now, yes. is still award-winning. Absolutely. His students are winning awards every single year. This year, seven national awards. They're the number one college station in the country. And that may have gone a long way to influencing Dr. Deborah Curtis's decision to celebrate Morgan's legacy in their radio broadcasting this fall. That is phenomenal. And Dr. Perry, you touched on it briefly last segment, but let's hear a little bit more about Rich Green from your perspective. Yeah, well, Rich is doing a great job there at Indiana State. Uh, one of the things that is so important about campus radio organizations is they involve a lot of students. And for those students, a lot of times that it becomes kind of like their home away from home. They, they, the folks they do radio with are kind of like a second family. Um, and and today we don't do the Peter Rabbit music, uh, Peter Rabbit news service, or the uh, uh, the uh, the Princess Music Box of the Air, uh, you know, those uh, storybook Princess of the Air, I'm trying to remember the name of it. We don't <laughs> do those kind of shows. It's more about playing music and, and some news and, and maybe sports, things like that. But still, it's such an important place. And the person who's the radio station sponsor becomes kind of the uh, surrogate parent, I think. Yes. To 50 or 60 students, you know, I mean, most professors, you're in the classroom, the students come in, they, they're there for an hour or so, and then they're off to do their homework, and you see them again in a couple days. In a radio station, the students go to class, then they come to your radio station, and they're there for four hours, you know? That is... <laughs> and uh, so, so Rich is, uh, you know, he just has a great heart. He's, he's uh, doing great work there with the students at the radio station. I'm excited. How about you? Definitely. <laughs> so, Doc, 2003 induction into the Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. I know you probably had some goosebumps just hearing well, about it. Well, was, it was a bittersweet yeah. experience because it was sweet to see Dad recognized, but here I was many years later sitting at a table with many former broadcasters that I had been on the air with. And uh, many of the gentlemen who were in that room had seen radio as they knew it. You know, radio was all built by families. Yeah. And even back then, it's all now corporate, with rare, rare, rare exception. And it just broke their hearts to see the old, the true radio, you know, the kind of thing that, that Dr. Perry was talking about, where you got together, you put on a live radio drama, you know, specifically done by your local people for your local mm -hmm. people, that's gone today, and we've lost a heck of a lot. So it was a it was beautiful to 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 be a part of Dad's induction. It was beautiful to see the the men, and occasionally there were a couple of women there, with whom I had broadcast. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was tough because there were a lot of sadness in that radio as we knew it was gone. Oh. So, Mary, let's transition to 2006, the University of Central Florida. Well, in 2006, I was a master's student, and the gentleman across the table from me was my crisis communication professor. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's how this all got started. That's how this yeah. all got yeah. started. So now I know. <laughs> yes. Yep. Okay. She spotted my lapel pin and asked me a question. And from yep. that, this whole mess was born. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. So we must always start somewhere, Doc. We must. So Regent University. Mm -hmm. Let's move on a few years forward. Historical, okay. critical. 
Um, yeah, I went to Regent University with the intention of doing a dissertation in crisis communication. That's where I saw my future work. That's where I saw my love. And little did I know my tables would be turned completely after I did the initial paper we discussed earlier on Dr. Morgan. I decided to take it further and do a dissertation and just fell in love with the story and the family. And it's a privilege and an honor to pursue this line of work. Dr. Perry, I know that Mary is quite the humble one, but Broadcast Education Association, she's made several trips, hasn't she? She, she does. <laughs> she has, she's been out there and, and presented her research. Um, and, uh, and she not only presents her research, but she has made it um, much more, um, uh, I don't know, uh, just brought it to life, life, I guess, a lot more than is normal, uh, including bringing in guests who were the people who were on this, <laughs> this radio show that she's mm -hmm. talking about, the storybook Princess of the Air. Yes. Um, and, uh, yes, yeah, she's won awards that, that session where she brought uh, Julie Fairley, one of the former princesses, uh, to actually who – totally still from memory could recite mm -hmm. the opening lines to the program some 50 Phenomenal. years later. Um, you know, yeah. having her there, people at the conference said that was one of the most memorable mm -hmm. events of the whole conference. <laughs> so. so Mary, as you put it, and I, and I laughed when you told me this, people were putting down pens and notepads and listening attentively. Yes, they were. <laughs> she did the opening from her 1963 days and it involves the children sitting up straight, putting their hands in their lap oh, you, and their pens on their it? desk. You want to hear it? Have you got time? Oh, I, yes. <laughs> Let's hear it. Let's well, go for it. I, I had the pleasure of directing okay? and, and even writing for that, so I've heard it a lot. <laughs> Hello, boys and girls. Are you ready to listen to my story? That's mm -hmm. fine. Now, sit up straight, put your pencils on your desk, fold your hands, and I'll tell you the story of... That was the beginning. Okay, and I did follow your instructions. <laughs> and all the gentlemen. I noticed that. I appreciate that. <laughs> and no, all the gentlemen was... at that conference did exactly what she said. You saw 50 and 60 year old men sitting up straight and putting their hands in their laps. Well, Dad, to teach us the power of radio, before you could direct the story, Princess, you had to go out and sit in the back of a classroom yeah. while they were listening to the broadcast. And no, he didn't tell us what to watch for. But when we saw all those kids sit up straight and fold their hands and put, then we realized the power of what we were doing that we, had, we would never have grasped never. any other way. And it made you real serious about yeah. every word you said, every sound effect you used, everything. Yeah. Because we saw the, 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 the cause and effect right there. I love it. So, Mary, your journey, let's talk about your dissertation, its publication. Hey, a lot of hard work, Dr. Perry, right? Yes, always. <laughs> Dissertations are, are a labor for sure. <laughs> a labor of love. <laughs> so, well, Mary. It doesn't end there. Um, right now, there are two books that I'm working on doing proposals for. There's more academic articles. There's a lot more coming down on the Hoosier Schoolmaster of the Air. You have not heard the last of him. I know that we haven't, and we want to also talk about the huge event coming up and the significance of Josh Shepard, Library of Congress Radio Preservation Task Force. Yes, um, the Library of Congress has a project, the Radio Preservation Task Force. Josh Shepard, Dr. Joshua Shepard is the director. He caught wind of my research and totally embraced it. Uh, the Library of Congress is very interested in preserving all of radio broadcast history. And so Dr. Shepard has been just encouraging Phenomenal. me, just truly encouraging me. He'll be speaking this fall at Indiana State University ceremonies to honor their radio and Dr. Morgan's legacy. Speaking of legacy, and we have so many great images that we have put up on the screen <laughs> throughout the show. One particular image that I loved, I believe it was a picture of your mother and father at Thanksgiving. And I saw a nice table, lots of food. Your mom, I believe, was holding a platter. Don't worry, we have, we have seen a lot, haven't You're we? You're right, indeed. But, but family gatherings for you as we close, because the significance of family, that mm -hmm. bonding, 
process is something a lot of times that we don't see much of in our technological age. Mm -hmm. So share one other memory, a little short story for us, well, if you will. Uh, the Morgans are a very, very tight family. Uh, they always were. Dad was one of five, and as he said, his dad was a coal miner. Uh, so every Thanksgiving and every Christmas, everybody was home. And mom always cooked a big turkey and she always baked pumpkin pies and that kind of business. And even when I married my beloved Karen and we had children, you know, we always came back if we possibly could. In the early years it was a little yes. tough financially, but we would come back and uh, we and would be there that. at Thanksgiving and at Christmas and so that our Good sons, time. our sons could be a part of that legacy. Dr. Perry, would you like to share any parting words for Dr. Morgan and Dr. Myers? Well, I, I just uh, so appreciate the fact that, uh, that he's been willing to share of his family history to allow the story of his dad and, and the, the pioneer that he was in radio education to come to life because that really is, uh, you know, it, it's giving of yourself when you give of your family so so I appreciate that I've certainly had never met you and um, but I'm glad to have met you here on this broadcast and uh, so thank you for that uh, thank you for your contribution as well in Kentucky and in Florida and uh, I know the University of Central Florida has gone great guns uh, based on what you started there when they asked you to come in and build radio so yeah. This is groundbreaking research. So many more things on the horizon for both of you. I want to thank both of you very much for being on the show. Many thanks to you, Dr. Perry, as well. And of course, I want to thank all of our guests for joining us once again. We also want to express our sincere thanks to those who provided images and video clips for the broadcast. As a reminder, you can log on to ClarenceMMorgan.com to access a vast array of information about Dr. Clarence Morgan, who's your schoolmaster of the air. I'm Ramika Vincent Leary. Keep it locked in right here on WSRE PBS for the Gulf Coast. <laughs>